the, the first time I got to meet uh, Dan Cronin was about, I don't want to say Dan really, because it might make us sound older than we look, uh, probably about 25, 26 years ago. And, um, and we knew right away that Dan Cronin was going places, because he said, Chris, I'm going someplace I can't talk to you. And I said, I get that a lot, no problem. But uh, Dan went down to Springfield, and he tamed a lot of lions down there. And then a few years ago, came by, and uh, he said to people across this region, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach out for a different kind of uh, position of service. And it's in that position of service as chairman of the DuPage County Board that we've welcomed Dan before, and, and we welcome him today, and we look forward to welcoming him in the future, uh, because we get a very distinct view on the multi-layered structure of Illinois government that Dan has come to know in, in his career. It's uh, an insight from which we always benefit, and that's why I ask you now for a big, warm City Club welcome for DuPage County Board Chairman Dan Cronin. Hey, hey, hey. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for that very generous introduction. Uh, thank you, Jay Doherty and Tweed Thornton, uh, for the marvelous work that you do here at the City Club. And uh, the way that you handled that cancellation nearly two weeks ago was remarkable. And the best part of it was that you got the food to uh, people that really needed it. So that's marvelous. And you deserve a round of applause for that. If I may, uh, I know there's a number of elected officials here today, and, and, and all of you are important. Whether you're elected or not, you're all important, and I'm very grateful for you coming out today to listen to a few thoughts. Uh, but I do want to ask the county board members, the, these are critical members of our team in DuPage, if they'd be kind enough to stand up and be recognized. We've got Pete DeCiani right here, Tonya Corey is over here, Sean Noonan. Please remain standing. Jim Zay, our stormwater chairman. Lord knows he's seen a few things. Paul Fickner, Chairman of the Finance Committee, Sam Tornatori, and Brian Krajewski. Uh, really want to thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor for me to work with you. John Curran. John Curran is our Vice Chair, and uh, he is just a wonderful man, and I follow his lead frequently. We have Bob Berlin here from the State's Attorney's Office. He's the State's Attorney. It's always good to have a good friendship with the State's Attorney, and there he is. So thank you, thank you. And my lovely wife, Julie, joined us here today. She, thank you, dear. So, you know, uh, Chris, I, I know that you've had a few speakers here recently um, that uh, have delivered mostly bad news, right? Um, from the Congress and from the legislature. And, uh, you know, Lord knows, I know, uh, and I have a healthy appreciation for the monumental problems that they are facing, mm -hmm. the monumental challenges in the Congress and in the legislature in Washington, D.C., and Springfield. And um, so that said, you know, I'm here today from DuPage County, and I want to deliver some good news, ladies and gentlemen. So. During my last couple of visits here, uh, you may recall if you were here, I talked about my mission to reduce the size, scope, and cost of local government. And uh, we talked about this dubious distinction here in the state of Illinois. Yeah, we have uh, some 7,000 units of local government, right? More go local government than any other state in the union, right, Paul Green? But yeah, it's not even close. And, uh, and in, in DuPage, the enlightened DuPage, we, we have about 400 individual taxing bodies. So the good news I have to share with you today, and I, and I can hardly contain myself, I just want to share with you, we did it. We actually did it, really and truly. We eliminated a unit of local government. One lone taxing body is gone today. Thank you very much. Quite frankly, I don't know when the last time we were able to abolish a unit of local government, if ever, here in the state of Illinois, the land of many units of local government. And after the experience, I, I now know why. And let me share with you a little bit about our experience about the Timber Lake Estates Sanitary District. Uh, back in 1983, it was formed. 
uh, state law set it up uh, for the purposes of constructing a sewer system, right, for that area of unincorporated DuPage County uh, near Downers Grove. Two years later, the county of DuPage came in and took over the operations of the sewer system, the sanitary district. Now we're talking about a, a relatively small unit of government, it's about 104 residents. Even though the county took it over in 1985, here we are decades later, uh, the district still has a tax levy, they, they still have a board, I, I was obligated to appoint people to this board, and it was a non-functioning, uh, non-essential uh, unit of government. So when I found out about this when, two years ago when I first came into office, I, I asked a question that not a lot of people I think ask in government, if I may say, I said, why? Why, why do we have this, and what do we need to do to get rid of it? So there was a little provision in state law that allowed us to petition the court. You had to get the requisite number of signatures for this unit of government to, to get a dissolution. Um, we were advised by legal counsel. Uh, you know, I thought we'd just go to court, file the petition, end of it. They said, no, no, no. The legal counsel said, quote, we cannot just go to court. We have to first follow a number of procedural steps jump through numerous hoops per state statute before we can even ask the court to consider dissolution, even a non-functioning entity. So that started us on this legal odyssey of, of various levels of gymnastics. The first thing we did is we sent out a letter to the residents and sort of explained the situation to them and asked for them, and we got no response. We sent out a second letter uh, with, you know, with bolder print and, you know, with call outs and we really tried to get their attention this time and we, little or no response this time. And we were advised by legal counsel that if we don't get people to respond, we have to interpret that it's a no, right? So then we said, well, we got to take ads out in the local papers. We took some ad, we took an ad out in the Tribune, you know, really with a lot of color, trying to get their attention. No, no, I don't know if they didn't believe us, I don't know if they didn't care, I, I don't know what it was, but um, you, you can't blame them, I suppose, if they live in Illinois, uh, they're a little bit um, uh, skeptical about these kinds of things. Finally, what we did is we asked our public works department guys to actually go door to door. They actually went out door to door, knocked on doors, and they explained the situation to people face to face. And it take, took an enormous amount of time because we couldn't advocate. We had to explain the pro and con and let them come to the conclusion. Well, finally, after all of this, we were able to get the requisite number of signatures. We put it in our petition. We came to the circuit court. And Judge Bonnie Wheaton, my new hero, uh, she did the right thing and entered an order dissolving the Timberlake Estates District. There you go. Uh, but it was an instructive experience, right? You will see on your table a copy, and Chris talked about it moments ago, about zombie government. And the lesson for us was, gee, here's a non-functioning unit of government. Look at what we had to do. I mean, zombie government and, and, and really the, the, the theme was, you know, how do you kill the already dead in Illinois government? If it's this difficult to, to, to kill off a dead agency, how difficult you can only imagine it would be to one that's, that's not dead. But nevertheless, Tom, one down, 6,999 to go. Uh, in any event, so we, we, we know what we're up against. Um, uh, the question you might want to ask, okay, Cronin, you come down here, you talk about this stuff, you're taking on the establishment, these entrenched units of local government, it, it seems almost futile to try. Why do you do it? Well, I do it because I view it as my job. I sort of like a challenge, I guess. Uh, I like to take on the, the, the status quo. I, I think that it's my obligation to make sure that local government is operating uh, at the most optimal and efficient uh, manner, right? As chairman, I have this responsibility to appoint people to these various boards and commissions, some 52, 24 of which have taxing authority. They, they spend about $300 million of the taxpayers' money, and they have about 900 employees employees. This, these groups of appointed bodies really hadn't been reviewed very much and it was long overdue to take a closer look, to find out what was going on there because we had some bad experiences. Things have turned around in those places, the Water Commission and the Housing Authority, but at the time we had some bad experiences. We needed to open up the books, we needed to look at what's going on. Uh, we passed a bill in Springfield that gave us that authority. We were able to engage the private sector uh, uh, firm firm, Crow Horwath, to come out and, uh, and evaluate what's going on at these 24 different agencies. And they basically confirmed what we suspected, um, that we needed across the board reform at these various independent agencies. 
The report came back, like a lot of reports we've seen in government, uh, some of which sit on a shelf and collect dust. We didn't want that to happen. We needed an action plan. So last May, May 2012, we launched the DuPage Act Initiative. Act, of course, stands for Accountability, Consolidation, and Transparency. My thought was is that this is a good sample size of government, 24 agencies that really could serve as a laboratory, right, uh, to test new ideas and strategies, how to realize efficiencies. And if we were successful, we might be able to, you know, share it statewide or at least region-wide. Well, I'm here to tell you, to give you a little status report, I think we have realized some success, and I'm proud of it, and it's certainly been a team effort at the county. Um, one year since the start of ACT, we have um, the following. One, most agencies have adopted uh, uniform ethics policies and procurement policies where none existed before. Many have eliminated unneeded expenses like uh, credit cards and cell phones and travel. Travel policies were rather loose. Um, some personnel policies were eliminated and or shared with existing staff. Long-standing contracts, you know, the good old days when, you know, I guess uh, Senator Phillip wanted to take care of, I mean, we rebid those contracts and opened it up and we got lower prices. You know what I mean? We, we saved money. Basic information was posted on the internet, you know, like when the meeting is and what it is they're going to talk about. So uh, we, we posted it on the internet for the very first time. I mean, it was hard to believe that some of these agencies had no presence on the internet whatsoever. Um, we used the appointment responsibility. I've appointed some uh, 40 new people to serve on boards and commissions. And, and frankly, with all due respect to some of the predecessors, the appointment process in the past was really just sort of like, okay, this person's up, let's, let's appoint them again. Or if there was a vacancy, they'd kind of look around the office and say, well, Barb or George, do you, do you know anybody over there? And we really went on uh, a concerted effort to reach out into the community and to recruit new, young, and maybe not so young, but talented people that were right thinking. Um, and I'm pleased that we did this, and I'm pleased that we've realized some success. We appointed women to fire protection districts for the very first time. These minor changes alone, and I would consider them rather minor, they have uh, saved millions millions of dollars uh, over the last couple of years and will save millions into the future. We didn't just use this approach with these independent agencies. Of course, with Paul Fickner and the board members, we have a very frugal approach, approach to our budget. And uh, we have done some innovative things that I'm real proud of. The arrangement that we worked with Kane County, and we have the Kane County chairman here today, Chris Lousen, my former colleague. We're just thrilled and delighted. <laughs> that we now send our juvenile offenders that used to be in our underutilized youth home in DuPage, they go out to King County, just down the road. There was a considerable amount of resistance to doing that because it was change. But they now go to this regional facility and all the reports have been very, very positive. We've also uh, reformed our employee benefit packages, saving some $20 million over the next 20 years. We've cut headcount and we've reduced our budget by 13 million. So for me, I guess after spending 20 years in Springfield and being in and around government, it was really important, if you're gonna go on a reform effort, you've gotta have measurable, tangible results, right, Brian? I mean, uh, so many times we'd see these reform efforts and the result, the conclusion page was that people have a higher self-esteem or you know, the teachers and, and parents feel good about themselves. Um, we wanted to have measurable, tangible results, but I, I think, on top of the measurable results, if I may say, I, I really think that we have uh, sort of influenced a, a change in the culture, at least in DuPage. Uh, people are looking at these kinds of things, consolidation, working together, whether it's a stakeholders group, whether it's our favorite mosquito abatement districts, right? The 45 different entities in DuPage County that are charged with the important responsibility, important public health responsibility of mosquito abatement. We know that, that this is not the most efficient model in the world because we know that of the 45 entities, um, there are 36 uh, separate individual contracts with the same provider, the same vendor. So we know that this is not the best way, it's not the most efficient way. 
Uh, last week, we brought together representatives of the 45 different entities for the first time, this task force. And they are going to come forth with recommendations about how to do a better job, how to uh, look at best practices from a public health standpoint, and uh, save money in the process. Our ability, our ability, however, to tackle some of this uh, and to take on some of these consolidation uh, is a little bit limited. And so we have now taken our fight to the legislature. Um, my office drafted Senate Bill 494, which is a very narrowly drafted bill, and it only affects DuPage County. Uh, so if you represent some townships or somebody out there, they don't have to be alarmed. This is just DuPage County and just the boards and commissions that we appoint. Um, and Senate Bill 494 has been well received in the Senate. And I need to thank Senator John Cullerton, the Senate President. Um, from the very beginning, he understood it, he appreciated it, he's embraced it. Um, we've had an outstanding experience working with John Cullerton in the Senate. We've also had some pretty effective lobbyists and public relations people. But I have to tell you a little story, if I may. Um, last month, I traveled to Springfield to testify on this bill, Senate Bill 494. So I go down there, and you know, I, I, I you kind of feel, you know, you go back, you have a mixture of emotions. You spent 20 years down there, but you go down there, went over to the Senate. The bill was before the Senate Executive Committee. Um, and it was nice to see some former colleagues, and there was a good exchange, and they understood it, they appreciated it. It was a, such a positive experience. The bill passed out of the committee unanimously. So I was happy. The next day I woke up, I went over to the House. Went over to the House side, and I went into the House committee over there, and I sat down, and there was a little question and answer, and I just got that feeling in my <laughs> gut. You know what I mean? That familiar feeling that I had a few years ago when I was in Springfield that was one of the reasons why I left there. And uh, I just knew that the bill was going down, and, and it did. It, went, it was defeated. On, it was essentially the same bill, a little slightly different version. But one of the people that voted no uh, expressed a, really a grave concern about this slippery slope. You know, oh my God, a slippery slope into more efficient, you know, uh, 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 more effective, more accountable government. But I'm not giving up, and I have to tell you, Senate Bill 494 passed out of the full Senate last Friday, 51 to nothing, so it's on to the House right now. Now, while DuPage County is, is clearly my mission, and I'm, I'm enjoying it very much, I, I, I do think it's appropriate to take a look at the bigger picture. Um, and I think it's fair to say that we are, we are you know, drowning, uh, and there's a lot of drowning going on these days, but we are drowning under the cost of government. Um, and we see that people are voting with their feet, right? Um, the state of Illinois is, is ranked number two in the nation in terms of out-migration. People are leaving the state. Uh, residents and businesses, they can't flee soon enough. And frankly, I, I, you know, you almost hate to admit it because I, I love the great state of Illinois, uh, land of Lincoln and DuPage, but I think all of us would admit there have been a few times when you hear another round of bad news, you'd turn to your friend or family and say, why do we live here, you know? Well, uh, I got to tell you that uh, what we're trying to do is to try to be the example in DuPage, right? But you have to look at the bigger picture to give yourself perspective. Um, the AP reported earlier this month that two Illinois-based companies uh, are expanding in South Carolina. Uh, Boeing, whose corporate headquarters is right here in the city of Chicago, is expanding its facility in that state. They're spending $1 billion and creating 2,000 new jobs. In, in South Carolina. And you're, I'm sure they talked about it at their board meetings here in Chicago. Uh, McLaughlin Body Company is building its first plant outside of Illinois, again, in South Carolina. And, you know, we continue to be a ripe target. Uh, Rick Perry, governor of Texas, came here last week, and, and I actually ran, bumped into him over at some event downtown here. He's got really nice hair. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, but he's, uh, he talks about, God, you know, get out while there's still time, you know? And um, he talks about their, their no personal income tax and the low unemployment rate down there. And I don't really fault Governor Perry. I really don't. Um, and I would not dismiss him. And I think those leaders, some folks I saw who, you know, just sort of uh, was rather dismissive. And, you know, I mean, I think dismissing competitors like Texas 
as some sort of redneck rubes who aren't as smart and as sophisticated as we are here in the city of Chicago in this region, I, I think is unwise. And I think it's a prescription for failure, frankly. Uh, the reality of the situation is, is that places like Texas, Indiana, North Carolina, they are our competition. And it's formidable competition. Our region is aging. And uh, we must now compete with these, these new aspirational cities that are called Charlotte, Nashville, Houston. There was an article last week by a demographer. Um, I read a lot about demographers. I, read, I make sure I'm up on top of that. And we, we, um, but they talked about the trendsetters of the future. And uh, they're not the legacy cities. In Chicago, New York, Boston, we're legacy cities. But rather, the trendsetters are, quote, a crop of newer, more sprawling urban regions located in the Sun Belt and the Great Plains. Newer, more sprawling urban regions. That once was us. That used to be DuPage County. We were the young buck in town. Everyone wanted to be us. Uh, people and businesses were moving out to DuPage in droves. There were new office parks, highways, new schools. Uh, they were going up everywhere. But now they, the South Carolinas, the aspirational cities, they are the new young guns. And we're sort of like the middle-aged guy that's trying to keep up. Um, Cranes had an article recently, um, and they actually compared DuPage County to uh, turning the big 5-0, right? And as anyone who's middle-aged, myself included, uh, you don't really like it when somebody points that out to you. I don't know why, you just don't like it. And um, actually, the whole region is turning, is middle-aged in the 50s. We just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the International Terminal at, uh, at uh, O'Hare Airport when John F. Kennedy came out here and they cut the ribbon with Richard J. Daley. But the question is, as we meet, as we arrive at this sort of midpoint in our life, so to speak, um, like anyone who's in mid middle age, you sort of take stock of where you are, and, and you say, well, you know, where are we going? Where, where are we now, and where are we going? Well, I think uh, it's fair to say that there are two different governing models, if I may offer. Um, in, in DuPage, we, we plan to build on our traditional advantages of uh, you know, outstanding public schools, safe neighborhoods, low cost of doing business, um, a AAA bond rating at the county. Um, my wife would say charming, county board chairman. I don't know if that's true or not. I won't go that far. but. Uh, but I think here in Chicago, and, and uh, I think it's fair to say that they're, in my estimation, it sort of looks like they're following the luxury city model uh, designed to attract high income, high wealth individuals to the city. And, and they are succeeding. They are succeeding quite well at the moment. And, um, and, and New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg actually coined that phrase, luxury city. I didn't come up with that. And it's been documented in other demographer magazines and so forth. Michael Bloomberg, you know the godfather of the second congressional district. He, uh, he said, uh, quote, if New York City is a business, it isn't Walmart. It isn't trying to be the lowest price product in the market. It's a high-end product, maybe even a luxury product. So you can see this approach, this approach to the city and their governing right here in the neighborhood. And it's marvelous. You have from River North down to the South Loop, you have pricey condos, you know, uh, restaurants, exquisite restaurants, beautiful, expensive boutique hotels. It's marvelous. And you can bring your family down there. I come down here frequently. My wife and I take in a Bulls game or a Bears game. I know many of you do. This is an attractive place for suburbanites to come down and spend a chunk of your kid's college savings account for a weekend on the town. Um, but not only is it attractive to suburbanites coming down here, but we also see another interesting phenomenon. And you know, we all know folks that are in this category, baby boomers or empty nesters, that you know, their kids are grown, they're out in the suburbs, they want to come back down into the city. Um, they, they, they buy a condo, um, they get to go out to dinner, have a glass of wine, maybe you know, go to the theater, and, and they like it. And it's sort of interesting, though, it's a paradigm shift because it used to be over the last 20 or 30 years that a lot of the wealthier or people that would, they, they would move out of the city into the suburbs. Now we see this sort of reverse commute. Interestingly, at the same time in DuPage, we're gaining more middle class families and manufacturing businesses that can't afford uh, the cost of the city. 
So while Chicago is becoming, I would argue, somewhat more economically segregated, um, DuPage, ironically enough, is becoming more diverse economically and ethnically. Uh, but more than anything else, I think the luxury city model is about financial need. So somebody's got to come down here and, I mean, there's a billion dollars of fire in place. We love Chicago, but let's face it, there, there are some monumental challenges that we all face. And, and there's got to be some people that are willing to help pay for that. It will be interesting to see how these different approaches will play out in the future. One that relies on, on, on the sort of luxury city model, one that is sort of traditional low cost, low cost of doing business environment. But it's clear, one thing is absolutely positively clear. Um, with the fierce competition that we're up against regionally, with the aspirational cities, this, you know, the south, the southwest, southeast, um, Poaching businesses from different uh, areas, DuPage or City of Chicago, uh, just to make a point in the newspaper one day, really is not meaningful for the overall health of the region. And, uh, and we have some huge opportunities uh, on the table that we are working together collaborati collaboratively on, wh whether it's the Elgin O'Hare, Western Access, uh, which uh, which is has huge economic potential, or you know the struggles and the challenges there are to 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 divvying up uh, the limited public transit dollars. Um, but really, in closing, let me share this thought with you, if I can, uh, if I may. I. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about turning middle age and in your 50s, I'm 53. And perhaps the most depressing uh, thing that happens during middle age is you, you put on some weight in areas where you don't really need it, right? A little bit of fat and you lose some muscle fiber, right? And I think that's a fair metaphor for government in this region. It's big, wasteful, inefficient, right? And if we don't cut the fat, get in shape, do more with less, like we're trying to do in DuPage County, I think we are seriously jeopardizing our future for the next 50 years. And at 50, uh, you all are, have reached that. You, you feel like you have a little more wisdom and experience. You have a good sense of the truth. Um, you have little patience for hypocrisy and inaction. And um, so I, um, I think also at 50, you have something to prove. Right, and uh, my mission, my commitment, what I have to prove is I want to prove to skeptical taxpayers out in DuPage County that real reform can happen, that you can achieve it. And if we're successful and when we're successful, we could share this model statewide. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Dan Cronin. Now, the conversation turns over to you. We've got these strategically placed question sheets, and I've even got one right here with a question on it. So I'll get started. But please write your questions down, and then we've got our friends here who will pick them up. Thank you. Let's get a, have we got a water? All right. Dan, you gave us a lot to think about. Here, uh, let's see. Here is a question from Joyce Saxon, one of our three city club governors here today. One of our five, I guess, five or six. All right. This, this question was, is what did you do with the, the juvenile detainees when the facility, the detention facility closed? Well, you know, we had uh, an, uh, enough time to plan for the transition, and uh, so we, we did our due diligence. Uh, our board members, Bob Larson, Judicial Public Safety, we toured, we looked at. So they were there until it was time for them to move to Kane County. So they weren't, you know, in, uh, hanging out at, you know, McDonald's around the corner or something. We, we made sure that they were properly um, supervised. Um, you know, the facility was underutilized. We were spending a lot of money. The state of Illinois wasn't paying for juvenile detention. Um, and so we, we, it was very costly, and uh, there was a lot of vacancy there. And it seemed silly. We had this marvelous award-winning facility just down the road in Kane County. So, you know, I thought it was a no-brainer. 
Terrific. Mark Wiermiller asks, uh, about the Illinois pension mess and fix, uh, Dan, would you support IRAs and 401ks for all new state, county, uh, state and county employees and teachers to start to phase out of government-defined benefit pensions? Well, I, I guess the short answer is yes. Uh, when I was in the legislature, I co-sponsored uh, a constitutional amendment that provided just that, that on a go-forward basis there would be an opportunity uh, to do a defined contribution rather than a defined benefit. So uh, the answer is yes. Now, we, we have made significant strides in DuPage uh, with our employee benefit package cost reduction. And uh, we invited the employees to come in and be part of the conversation. It, you know, it was a very uh, productive exercise. Board members, Paul Fickner, a lot of guys, Brian Krajewski were involved in that. It really was, uh, it was really nice to see how it worked collaboratively. Um, and, you know, we're a member of IMRF, which is really uh, one of the best funded. But having said all that, I think the idea of defined benefit plans, uh, I think, you don't see that uh, in the private sector. Our goal is to try to take a lesson from those experiences in the private sector. And, uh, yes, we would definitely be open and willing to support that approach. Terrific. Uh Questions? Any questions coming down here, coming my way? I've got one for you, Dan, quick one. Yes, uh, about the, the spirit of regional solutions to these issues. Uh, you mentioned that your uh, fellow county board chairman, Chris Lawson from Kane County, is here. Uh, between yourselves as county board chair people, from Lake down to Will, and of course the mayor and Tony Preckwinkle, what kind of coordination are all of you engaged in on an ongoing basis? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And I'm learning about, well, I've learned about organizations that really require us to sit and, and look at each other and talk about issues of common interest. One of the organizations that I think is, really does a marvelous job is CMAP. And uh, so I sit down, we meet, we work with all the Collar County chairmen, um, uh, the city of Chicago. Tony Preckwinkle has really been a delight to work with. Um, and so I think the regional collaboration, uh, particularly on the big issues, public transit, public health, um, you know, uh, it's imperative that we work together. And I think there are forums for that. Coming down here and having an opportunity to share some thoughts in Chicago at the City Club it helps promote regional uh, cooperation or regional understanding. And, and so I think any kind of opportunity like this and those types of organizations like CMAP um, uh, give us the chance to work together. I know everybody talks about working together, um, but it, you know, if we're competing with Charlotte and we're competing with Houston, uh, we do have to leverage, you know, we have things to offer in DuPage County that I think that are beneficial to the city of Chicago. And Chicago has things that they can offer that we can't. So it's imperative. Terrific. Uh, David Hiller of the McCormick uh, Tribune Foundation and Cantini, uh, conveniently located in DuPage County. Uh, can you talk about youth violence and the gun problem such as it is out in DuPage? Well, we, we have our problems in DuPage. Uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I hesitate, the state's attorneys here, I would not say gun violence is, is the number one challenge that we have. Uh, we have a problem with drugs. Uh, we have a problem with serious drugs. And, uh, you know, heroin, uh, we have synthetic drugs out there. Um, I, you know, I just was on the phone with the uh, superintendent of a local public school. Um, we have people dying. Uh, kids, overdoses. Uh, so we have serious problems with drug pushers, people that come into the, the, the county, people that, you know, it's Heroin Highway is, uh, comes right through uh, Elmhurst and, and the western suburbs. Um, so, you know, gun violence is uh, part of that equation. I know that because it plays itself out here in the city primarily, and they're fighting over drugs and turf war. So it's a real serious problem. And, uh, you know, um, this is a problem that uh, is not relegated only to, to the city of Chicago, but I think we all uh, suffer 
because of gun violence. And so to the extent we can work together and collaborate on that, you know, um, uh, I, we're, we're all in. You know, we're all in. We've got a very, very uh, committed professional law enforcement team with Bob Berlin and our sheriff. But yeah, it's serious and it, it's depressing and it's tragic. And what you see every day, you pick up the newspaper and you read about it and it makes, my, makes me sick to my stomach. But, uh, but yeah, in DuPage County, uh, the number one problem, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, I think we've, we've got a problem with drugs, with young people taking uh, very potent, uh, dangerous drugs. Very, very serious uh, question. Uh, wherever you're from, DuPage or the city or the suburbs of Cook, um, show of hands, in, in your com I'll do marijuana, cocaine, and heroin. In your community, which one, is, which one is the prevalent issue? Everybody, marijuana. Everyone? Okay, just a few. Cocaine. Heroin. It's, it's a new day. It's a very new day. From Ed Mazur. City Club uh, Governor, Dan, have you ruled out or under what conditions would you consider a candidacy for statewide office? Wow. Well, that's very kind. Uh, I appreciate the confidence. Um, and, uh, you know, I really love what I'm doing right now. Uh, there may be an opportunity in the future to pursue it. I wouldn't rule anything out. Um, and I'm flattered, I guess, sort of. Uh, I love the idea of, of governing. I'm not sure I love the idea of campaigning to govern, but, uh, but I appreciate that, Ed. That's very kind. Thank you. Marty McLaughlin of the City Club Board of Governors. Do you have a question? We've got a... No, just okay, very good. All right, terrific. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, did he earn a City Club mug? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, hey, we've got...